those aren't the only two choices. There are devices that will allow us to control I and I. And for that presentation, I'd like to bring up Lee. Lee has uh, been with a little company by the name of uh, Cretex Specialty Products for way too many years. <laughs> He's about ready to retire. I was supposed to say that, but um, I think Cretex has been involved with NASCO for how many years? Since the 80s. And you've been involved as well, right, during that time frame? early 2000s for not quite 20 years but yeah, we're all the nasco freaks up here but uh thank you welcome lee thanks don appreciate it. so again i'm lee hessig i've been with creek tech specialty products for going on 30 years um and um you know I've, I've been involved in the industry and really enjoy this industry a lot it's a lot of great people and there's there's a lot a lot to learn um so one of the things that I always like to try to do here and point out is, you know, everybody's got their own definitions, and but I, I think the biggest thing, and again, definitions, you know, um, these are pulled from various sources. The biggest thing is, is that we really need to separate I and I. It's always I and I. It's not, oh, I have an inflow problem, or I have an infiltration problem, or because, one could be true, one could not be, you know, they might have one, not the other, or both. So, but it's very common that they're lumped into I and I, and I guess that's always kind of kind of disturbed me. So I always try to point out that they are really two very different things and um, need to be addressed in different ways. Um, and of course, rainfall de dependent or derived inflow and infiltration as a result of a rain event. Another thing that that is uh, often uh, under, I guess, I don't know how to say it, not really looked at specifically is, is kind of zones and manholes. There's really two levels, upper levels and lower levels. In the northern climates where you get freeze-thaw, um, the upper level has different sources of, of uh, the environment, winter freeze-thaw, different things can occur in the upper section. So you have to be aware of any devices or technologies that you're using. Are they gonna perform in a freeze-thaw zone? How are you going to apply them, install them, and, and those things? And then the lower level, which is below the cone or corbel in a brick manhole, would be, you know, you'd be looking at different technologies that are gonna perform in different ways uh, below, below that, that part of the manhole. <clears throat> so again, inflow, or infiltration. So I'm gonna play this video, and this is kind of a trick video, but um, it'll be pretty easy to figure it out. Um, so this is a leak that was present in the manhole that we observed, and apparently from what the owner said, it had been this way for many, 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 many years, as he put it. So if you can imagine a leak like that, um, going into your system every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year for years, that is contributing just from one, one source, a, a lot of, you know, a lot of water into the system that doesn't really need to be there. Um, technically it is infiltration. It comes from a groundwater spring that was uh, right in the area of the manhole and due to uh, the fracture that occurred between the cone and the concrete grade rings, it allowed this water to begin leaking and then over time, it slowly eroded uh, the mortar between the rings and now you've got this gigantic leak. Um, you know, it's kind of the holy grail, if you will. Um, they're out there um, and certainly they need to be addressed like all the other leaks that are in your system. But again, it's, it's just, you know, if, if that water table wasn't where it was and you got a heavy precipitation event, then that leak would technically have probably converted into inflow or rain-derived, uh, rain-dependent inflow infiltration because it would have gone through the ground a little bit to get to the top of the cone. But So just really try to keep them separate. I guess it's always bothered me that I and I, I think it should be I or I, uh, but that's just me. So, um, 
So again, starting with leakage sources, um, in the upper portion of the manhole, the first thing you're gonna look at is gonna be the manhole cover. Um, there were some other examples, great examples of, of uh, submerged manholes, smoke testing that was being done that, that showed where this, these leakage sources are. Open vent holes, open pick holes, um, non-machined bearing surfaces, um, and those are all contributors. Years and years ago, again, we've been looking at these problems going back well into the 70s, and Nina Foundry did a study that uh, they tested all kinds of different frames, all kinds of different uh, various openings, size of openings, the amount of water above the manhole, and just a single one-inch vent hole uh, can provide contribute anywhere from a half a gallon to over four gallons a minute just from one tiny little vent hole in a sewer cover. Uh, so if you can imagine that in a, in a flooding situation where the mantle's in a low-lying area during a heavy rain, that, that's a lot of water going in through just one manhole cover. And if there's multiple holes and multiple manhole covers, that's a lot of water. So addressing these areas of the manhole um, are very important. Um, that single 24 inch diameter manhole cover with a non-machined bearing surface contributed even more, almost four gallons a minute to over 17 gallons a minute with just a, a, a cover with no gasket or anything in there to prevent water from getting in around the cover. Um, so these leakage sources just at the very top can be pretty significant. Um, in today's world, most communities, most people are using solid lids with non-penetrating pick holes that have gaskets um, as part of the installed system with machine bearing surfaces. So this example in Wisconsin happens to be in my neighborhood on a nice spring day, snow's starting to melt. This cover is submerged. So if this wasn't a solid lid with a gasket, all that water would have been contributing to the collection system and somebody would have probably been scratching their head it was a nice sunny day and they're going where's all this water coming from in this area well it was snow melt um, so again it shows you the importance of, of sealing the the covers um, so but there's a lot of existing covers out there that um, that don't have the gaskets or non-penetrating pick holes so um, we we termed devices a couple of years ago when Don and I put together you know this portion of the presentations uh, you know a couple of years ago. But um, devices, technologies, you know, um, you, you can refer to them what you want. But inflow dishes, uh, lid gaskets, um, vent hole pick hole plugs. Uh, these these uh, devices are available out there. Um, there's a lot of different types of them. There's a lot of different manufacturers and suppliers of these devices. The upper left-hand photographs shows a series of uh, simple rubber vent hole plugs that are uh, manufactured to size uh, different uh, uh, vent hole openings and sewer covers so you can relatively easy to, to go out and just plug these holes. Uh, the lower left is uh, rubber gaskets. There's a couple different uh, uh, manufacturers of gasketing material, different types uh, from rubber to butyls and, and other mastic type devices. Um, and again, these can be installed into existing frames. Uh, you need to do a little surface prep work to make sure that the product is gonna perform as, as designed, uh, but then they can be bonded down to existing frames and you can create that that watertight seal there between the frame and, and the uh, cover. And then inserts or salad bowls, inflow dishes, whatever you wanna call them, they're, they're, they're called a variety of different things, but they're available in, in stainless steel for more corrosion protection and rigidity, um, polyethylene, uh, HDPE inflow dishes, there's some PVC ones, there's, there's quite a variety of different styles out there, but. Um, again, just examples of relatively inexpensive, uh, easy uh, products that you can install uh, either with your own utility crew or under contract on, on rehab uh, jobs. So inflow, uh, so we're gonna look at some inflow sources in the upper portion of the mantle and that would be the frame chimney joint. So anything from the cone up to the frame, um, that's gonna involve you know, uh, broken and deteriorated 
bricks, uh, precast concrete grade rings, mortar joints, um, those things are typically going to deteriorate over time and you're gonna lose any kind of seal that might have been there when they were installed. These couple of examples just uh, happen to be, you know, one, the, up, the left hand one is during a snow melt. Um, it was in a field and um, the water was just draining in because the ground below was frozen. So the water didn't have anywhere to go except through that frame, frame joint between the top of the structure. And then the other one is just uh, an active leak during a rainstorm. I think Jim mentioned, a couple of you guys mentioned getting out during a rainstorm or post right post rainstorm and, and start identifying these you know problem areas and defects that can be that can be corrected. Um, additionally, um, we talked a little bit about you know some of the methodology, the ways that you can go out and, and, and find these defects. Uh, was mentioned that some of it, most of it hasn't really changed over the years, smoke testing and dye water testing. Um, but here we talked about post rain event. This is in Houston back in the early 90s, just before they started their big I and I program. And uh, you can see, you know, you got some flooded roadways, a little low area, and where's all the water going? Well, look, again, this is just one manhole where this amount of water is coming in from that precipitation event. So you had that ponding area. So anything like that is, is prone to that. And that's going to be there right during the rain event and immediately post rain event. Um, I love this video because it's one of the oldest known SSES study videos done in the city of Milwaukee on their pollution abatement program back in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, and is simple low tech as this is it's a very effective way to identify the leakage uh, and quantify some of the leakage if it's enough where you can actually do like they did here and stick a, a bucket under there and we'll stop watch and you can very easily uh, determine you know the rate of, of uh, inflow that's coming in there uh, but i just think it's really cool is in our backyard and, and ultimately that's what led to development of, of some uh, different technologies and devices for sealing that portion of the manholes in the early 80s. So prevention devices, again, for inflow. Um, there's a number of them, uh, internal and external manhole frame chimney seals. Um, there's also frame chimney liners and coatings that are applied. And manual grade adjustment systems now have, have advanced over the years. Um, it's not just brick and mortar and concrete anymore. There's, there's other alternatives in the, in the uh, grade ring portion of the manhole too for new construction. So, um, and don't think of these products specifically for rehabilitation. They can also be and are often used uh, new construction to prevent this portion of the manhole from ever leaking in the beginning. So it's kind of a preventative, again, be proactive instead of reactive. We've got enough manholes that need to be repaired. So mechanical uh, rubber internal chimney seals, uh, generally these are installed above grade. Uh, one or two man crew is usually all you need. Um, in rehab conditions, there's generally going to be some uh, surface preparation required. There might be some repair needed on the top of the cone where the bottom of the seal is going to compress against. Um, wire brush the frame. It doesn't need to be sandblasted or bead blasted or power washed or anything like that. Not to say that you might not in some cases have to do that, but uh, usually you don't need to do that. Um, so uh, it's generally pretty straightforward and if these are used in new manholes, little to no prep is actually uh, required. The one thing, you know, to note we were talking about some design lives and expected uh, light life of uh, chemical grouts and some of these other technologies that are used in sewer rehab. Uh, these products have been around uh, since the early 80s, so we're, we're at about a 40 year uh, known design life uh, of, of these types of systems in, in the sewer. Um, the rubber, the stainless steel bands that are used conforms to ASTM C923, which is the flexible connector, um, band, pipe to manual connector specification. So it's, it's a specification that's used, uh, been used for a long time, going back to the 70s for those types of applications. Um, 
And then uh, new construction or reconstruction, there's external uh, chimney seals. Again, these are rubber seals that are compressed either against the interior or onto the exterior of existing or new manholes. Um, again, comprised of upper and lower stainless steel bands. The upper band compresses onto the top of the manhole frame around the base flange, and the lower band is compressed onto the uh, outside of the top of the manhole cone, creating that watertight seal from the frame to the top of the cone. It's one of the most vulnerable joints in the collection system. Sees a lot of differential movement, freeze thaw, traffic loading, pavement expansion and contraction, different things that, that impact the upper portion of the manhole that you won't see in the lower portion of the manhole. Uh, again, I mentioned other technologies. There are uh, a myriad of other from cured in place uh, chimney liners, which I think Tony said he uses. Um, there's a polyethylene top hat device that goes in during new construction or reconstruction. There's a variety of applied coatings that are put on uh, by brush, by hand, by spray mechanism. Um, there's, there's absolutely no shortage of products uh, to choose when rehabilitating or installing uh, sewer manholes, to, again, to protect that frame chimney joint. Uh, the last one there is actually a heat shrinkable encapsulation system that's been on the market for quite a while. But um, the thing that you have to look at when you're, you know, kind of reviewing your project criteria, what your goals are, what, you know, what is your design life, how long does it need to last, you need to evaluate the technology that you're going to select against the time frame that it needs to perform. Uh, some of these have shorter design lives and expected life uh, than others. So um, you want to make sure that you're, you're looking at that as well. And again, there's none of the, you know, some of these are great for, you know, for one application, one might not be good for another. So again, none of these are gonna work everywhere. You know, so it's gonna be a combination of different technologies. i go back through this, whoops, I gotta go back. Sorry about that. So we talked a little bit about grade rings, uh, grade ring technology that's come along. Um, so again, kind of going back to that leaky manhole as a good example, that manhole, here's the evidence of the spring, um, a lot of groundwater present during this installation. Uh, but these grade ring systems are now designed uh, from composite or alternative to concrete materials. They're put together using um, watertight adhesives and sealants that can create a watertight joint between the grade rings, the top of the cone and the manhole frame and um, make sure that, again, that those rings are not going to deteriorate. Uh, they do not use any mortar. There's no shims. So some of the materials that would otherwise deteriorate over years are not going to be there to deteriorate. So this should extend the life of the new manhole or reconstructed manhole significantly. Um, so again, the goal here, build a watertight manhole using different technologies or devices to make sure that the top part of the manhole, the cover, the chimney, the frame joints, all of that is gonna be watertight. It can be done. You just need to find the right, the right product or, or device to do it. So moving uh, down into the lower level of the manhole, so now we're getting down into the barrel section or the, the main body of the manhole. Um, this doesn't really apply. I mean, it applies to brick manholes. There's a lot of leaks in brick manholes down below. Um, what we're going to talk about here are devices that are designed to seal specifically precast manhole joints. Um, so you can see the, the picture on the left. You can see a pretty good uh, stream coming in just to the upper right of the pipe penetration. And the uh, photo on the right hand side on the lower right shows a very significant leak at the, uh, the barrel joint at the very bottom, just above the bench. That was about eight inches above the bench of that manhole. Uh, again, these are generally going to be infiltration because it's down in the groundwater. These leaks are generally gonna be there. If the groundwater's there, these leaks are going to be present. 
<clears throat> so here's a really good example. And again, this is a video of the photo. So you'll get to see that this was actually leaking worse than the photo showed. So another one that is leaking all day, every day, for years. Uh, this particular animal happened to be adjacent to a uh, rainwater detention pond. So uh, there was, it was heavy groundwater, so there was a lot of water surrounding this particular manhole, and this thing leaked like that uh, constantly for, for years, they said. Um, why it was never addressed is beyond me. If they knew it was there, why they didn't try to deal with it. Uh, but it was a pretty significant leak. So again, prevention devices. Um, we have internal joint seals and external joint wraps. So obviously the internal would be used in rehabilitation predominantly. And then there's external manhole joint collars or wraps. Um, those wraps, and I'll, sh I'll show them to you here in a minute, but um, again, there are specific ASTMs that apply to exterior manhole joint wraps. It's a C877 is the specification, and there are three types. There's a type one, a type two, and a type three. Uh, type one is a peel and stick with a primer. Type two has bands in it that keeps it uh, physically banded or connected to the exterior of the structure. And then the third type is a just another peel and stick uh, where you place it on the joint and overlap the ends and it, and it sticks together with a mastic material. Again, these are quite often used um, in new construction as a preventative measure um, so that you know, when you put a new manhole in, again, especially in deep sewers, high groundwater applications, you want some extra protection. It's a very cost-effective way to deal with those joints on the outside so you don't have to come back later and rehabilitate it on the inside. Um, but an example of, uh, of an internal uh, uh, mechanical joint seal here, you can see manhole entry is required. So you need to follow all your confined space rules. Um, generally, there's going to be some surface prep, um, some light cleaning, possibly some surface repair if there's any defects in the manhole wall surface. Um, and then once that is done, then the seal, the bands are, are two-piece bands, so they're easily taken in through the manhole frame opening at the top. And the rubber seal is then positioned against the manhole wall. The bands are assembled in place at the joint and then tightened into place with a, an expansion tool, and then they're locked in place with stainless steel studs and nuts. Um, the last photo here that you saw is of the notorious leaking manhole in the video. So you can see that a very significant leak was stopped with this method of, of rehabilitation. Um, and the nice thing about it is um, it's like turning a water faucet off. You can actually watch the leak diminish to the point where it completely stops as you compress the bands against the manhole wall. Um, and again, like the other products, probably a 40 to 50 year design life. Um, and it's a compression seal, so it can be removed and reinstalled or adjusted if it ever develops a leak or something happens in the future where it needs to be uh, taken out. It can be taken out and, and used on another, on another manhole if possible. On the exterior, again, um, deep conditions, high groundwater areas where you want some added protection. This is actually a wet well. Um, so we definitely didn't want anything going in or out of it. So both infiltration and exfiltration was a concern. Uh, brand new structure, you're looking at um, externally for a joint, this was a 144 inch diameter structure. Uh, each joint wrap costs about $250 and takes under 10 minutes to install. Uh, so for a little bit of extra money up front, manuals can be prevented from ever leaking by, by placing these materials on the exterior of the manhole joints during new construction. They can also be used as a repair coupling, if you will. A lot of times if you have to add a barrel or you're changing a cone or doing something uh, where you're, you have to remove and replace manhole barrel sections, the new stuff isn't always exactly compatible with the old stuff. 
So oftentimes these are going to be used as a as a uh, compatible um, way to to seal the joint between the new piece and the old piece, the existing piece. Uh, but again, the last photo kind of shows it. You can see the you know the uh, PVC down into the water table where the pump head is in there to keep the water down during construction of this. Uh, sewer system in a subdivision and um, you know by placing these wraps and for a 48 inch manhole they're about $65 so again very inexpensive uh, way to ensure water tightness so those are some of the devices and different means and by all means there's no way I could have covered everything in in the 15 or 20 minutes um, so um, just try to give you a good representation of a variety of different things that are out there. Um, you know, hit the internet, hit some of the exhibitors here at the show and you'll find a, a, a whole array of different methods and technologies to, uh, to help keep water out of uh, manholes. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Mr. So, so Lee, uh, when Tony gave his presentation, he showed uh, a video of a manhole that wasn't leaking and as he lined it, it started leaking, uh, which would seem to imply that you should wait to do your manhole rehabilitation work after you've done your mains and your laterals. Do you agree or disagree with that timing? And if so, why? I would agree if, again, if, if the line if the main line or the line, again, the question is, is would you, would you do manual rehabilitation before or after lining? I think in most, uh, main line lining, I think in most cases, it would make sense to do the manual work after the main line lining is done. Again, this is my opinion. And I, and I say that because again, like we saw, the water is going to be forced up. If there's a groundwater table there and you now sealed everything off in the main line, it's naturally gonna to wanna to go up and travel and find another way in. Um, so if you've got a precast manhole or if you've got your pipe penetrations or something else that's leaking, uh, by doing the lining first, it'll help you identify the other defects that might need to be addressed at that time. Um, in conjunction with rehabilitation. And again, you might not need to do full depth lining on a manhole if you can do a point repair with a with an internal joint seal or even chemical grouting that opens up, you know, rather than spend the money to, to line a 15 foot deep manhole, which I've seen plenty of nice precast manholes getting liners to try to stop infiltration and that's not how you stop infiltration um, so again that would be my opinion and, I, and it's I just think it makes the most sense yes Tony uh, Lee just um, is there any required maintenance to the internal chimney boot to achieve its longevity that's a great question. The question was referring to any long-term or, or uh, routine maintenance required on internal uh, mechanical rubber chimney seals, as in I'm assuming you would be to retighten the bands. Um, the answer to the question is no. If the seals are put in properly, and again, part of this whole process with all of these technologies is making sure that you have good inspection, good oversight, because if if the liner's not going in right or your coating's not being applied properly, surface prep isn't being done right, um, it's, it's not going to perform as intended. Uh, we've seen examples of uh, contractors, installers try to put the seals in real fast. They don't follow the instructions. And by putting the seals, compressing that rubber fast, what it does is it kind of wads up the rubber all in one spot and then because rubber has memory, the rubber relaxes and the band isn't tight anymore. It loosens up to the point where it likely won't fall out. I've heard stories of seals falling out, but I've never actually seen one in the bottom of a manhole. But the, the seal is then loose and not doing its job. So in that case, <clears throat> periodic maintenance or routine maintenance would find that or a post rehabilitation or one-year warranty inspection like you do would be a great idea because then you can catch 
those. And in rehab, if you're doing whatever type of testing you might do on seals, uh, whether it's a, an infiltration test or a vacuum test or whatever you're doing, that could also be done again a year later to ensure that they're put in. But if they're put in right, I've taken seals out of manholes in the Milwaukee area that were put in in the early 80s that were still tight and doing their job. So the answer is really, there's not required if they're put in right. 